Well, hello there. Thanks for tuning in to another pr edition of Purple Power Play. I'm Brett Regan. And I'm Andy Burns. It was another busy weekend for K-State and the Manhattan community. And we've got it all. Football, basketball, volleyball, and more. But we start things off at the high school level, where Manhattan High looked to stay undefeated. That's right, Andy. After last Friday's heroics against Junction City, the Indians entered the 6A playoffs as the number one seed facing Mays. Our very own Cody Bansomer has the recap. Manhattan High School came off a last-second win against Junction City to win the district title, which put them in this game against the 3-6 and six Mays Eagles. Manhattan High School was a perfect 9-0 coming into the game and a number one seed, and that is how they would try to stay. On the second play from scrimmage, MHS running back Derek Campbell took the handoff 70 yards for a quick 7-0 lead, and that would be the last time either team would score until the third quarter. Right before half, MHS blocks this eagle punt and number four, James Holt from Manhattan High School, recovered the ball on the one yard line. But disaster struck. The very next play, Manhattan's number 20, Ty Suggs, fumbles the handoff and Mays recovered it in the end zone for a touchback. And then Mays would down the ball to go into halftime, only down seven to nothing. But MHS would bounce back and score 28 points in the second half and held a shutout until the last play of the game when May scored a two-yard touchdown. Manhattan High School will now face Wichita Heights in the second round of the 6A playoffs Friday, November 13th at home in Bishop Stadium. Kickoff time is 7 o'clock. Live from Bishop Stadium, Cody Bansomer, Purple Power Play. This should certainly feel like familiar territory for the Tribe. The team made it all the way to the championships last year. That's right, all the way there, only to get shut down by the Junction City Blue Jays. Now, while it was a big Friday night for Manhattan High School, the spotlight turned to Bill Snyder Family Stadium on Saturday. It was the 107th edition of the Sunflower Showdown. Melissa Von Lintel tells us about a rivalry filled with bitter history and passion. For four generations, the Fountain family has sported the Purple Pride. And there is nothing this group loves more than beating the Kansas Jayhawks. I just really want to win today, and I, it's just a big deal to us because they're our rival, and rivalry is a big deal in case of football. This passion can begin as early as the baby's first steps. The pride grows with each generation of K-Staters, which can last a lifetime. The fountains aren't alone. The parking lot around Snyder Family Stadium was chock full of folks ready to see the cats run down the Jayhawks. Some students see this rivalry face-off as the biggest game of the season. It's like two teams that have been blood, sweat, and tears for the whole year to this one moment to somebody got to win, somebody got to lose. Somebody got to so win. We don't know who's going to lose, but we know who's going to win. Win, purple. So. Purple, let's go, K-State, yeah! And many alumni bring their families to the Sunflower Showdown to show them this great tradition. Every year it happens. K-State and KU fight for bragging rights for their school and for the fans that watch. Hopefully hoping for a victory against their biggest rival. Melissa Von Lintel, Purple Power Play. So the fans were definitely pumped for the battle. Let's find out how the players responded. It was an electric atmosphere inside Bill Snyder Family Stadium on Saturday. The K-State crowd was loud and ready for this one, but the Sunflower Showdown was a bit of a letdown early as the highlight of a scoreless first quarter was K-State safety Emmanuel Lemur's interception of KU quarterback Todd Reesing. On the first play of the second quarter, K-State kicker Josh Cherry's 47-yard field goal put the Cats up 3-0. KU, though, would answer right back as Reesing hits Desmond Briscoe on the 17-yard touchdown pass. With KU ahead 7-3, it was Reesing who would give K-State some much-needed momentum. After fumbling on the previous possession, Reesing escapes a few wildcat defenders but in the end, he would be crushed by cornerback Joshua Moore and linebacker John Hulick. Lamar would recover the ensuing fumble, and the Wildcats would not look back. After the fumble, K-State would mount a three-play, 43-yard drive capped off by this 31-yard touchdown pass from Grant Gregory to Lamarck Brown that put the Wildcats up 10-7 going into the locker rooms. In the third quarter, the Wildcat rushing attack would take charge as running back Daniel Thomas punished the KU defense all day. Later in the drive, he fools both the cameraman and the defense on this five-yard touchdown run. With K-State ahead 17-7 late in the fourth quarter, even Willie's got trouble keeping his composure on the sidelines. But composure was no problem for Gregory as the quarterback keeper would seal the deal for Kansas State, who brings the Governor's Cup back to Manhattan 
for the first time since 2005. And what a great victory for the Wildcats as we take a look at the current division standings. Brett, it's been a while since you've seen a picture like this. Yes, it has. The Cats are atop the board. They hold a half-game lead on the Nebraska Cornhuskers with a 4-2 and two division records. That means the North Crown will likely become a two-horse race between K-State and Nebraska. The November 21st showdown in Lincoln will be a pivotal game. A victory over the Huskers captures the North title for the Cats, but if the Wildcats fall to the Big Red, Nebraska has to lose to both KU and Colorado if the Cats are to come out on top.